Okay, welcome to part 5 of this Excel VBA user forms tutorial. We're going to continue the theme of validating forms in this video, kind of picking up where we left off in the previous part of the series. But this time, rather than checking for individual controls for specific rules, we're simply going to be checking whether the entire form has been completed. So we'll talk to you about how you can test for empty controls, and we'll take two different approaches to doing that. We'll check controls individually using separative statements, but also show you how you can loop over all the controls on the form to test everything in one single sweep. When we're looping over all the controls, um, we need to make sure we can separate out the, the controls that have values from the ones that don't. So we need to separate out text boxes from labels, for instance. So we'll also show you how you can test what type of control you're looking at. So there's lots of detail to, to cover here. Let's get started. So in the previous video, we added some validation code to some individual controls to apply specific rules to each one. So as a quick reminder, for instance, we added some rules to the film gross text box to make sure that the user had to enter a number, first of all, and that that number wasn't negative. They could only proceed if the value they'd entered was a positive number. We did something similar with the release date text box as well to make sure the value entered was an actual date and the date wasn't in the future. The type of validation we're going to add in this video is slightly more generic than that. All we want to do is check that everything's been filled in. And the, the problem at this point is that I don't have to fill everything in before I click my Add to List button. So I, uh, I can end up in a situation where I've added a film that has no title, which I definitely want to avoid. The small problem we've got here with this type of validation is we can't take exactly the same approach we used for the individual specific rules. In the previous video, we used the before update event of these text boxes. The problem with that, with checking that, that text boxes aren't blank, is that the before update event might not be triggered. So the before update event, if you remember, only gets triggered if the user does enter something into a text box and then tries to move away from it. In this case, the user might simply choose not to change the value at all and then click the add to list button. So we've got to take a slightly different approach to making this sort of validation work. The first thing we have to do then is choose which event we assign our validation code to. And I think a sensible choice in this case would be the click event of the add to list button. That way we can make one single pass through all the controls on the form and check that everything's been filled in. So let's close the form down and head back to the Visual Basic Editor. And then making sure we've got the form open, we can get to the code behind the add to list button just by double clicking on it. And then that'll show us the code we added last time to, uh, to add in all the details to the, the, to the spreadsheet. What we're going to do before any of this code happens, we're going to check that everything on the form has already been filled in. One simple approach to this type of validation is to check each control one by one to see if they contain values. So let's use the film name text box as an example. We're going to add an if statement to the top. We're going to check if film name, film name dot value. Uh, we could also use the text property of the, of the text box as well. So rather than value, you can use text. If you remember from one of the earlier videos, these are essentially contain the same value. The only difference is in the data type. So text always returns a string. A value can return numeric or date data types as well. So I'm going to go for the value. I'm going to check if it's equal to an empty string. Then we're going to do something. I'm going to add in my end if statement just so that I don't forget later on. And then we can decide what we want to do. And as we saw in the previous video, there's a variety of things we could choose to do to indicate to the user that there's a problem. So we could make a message box appear on screen. The user could read the message and then click OK and then fix the problem. Or we could just simply change some formatting properties of the control at runtime. I tend to prefer the latter of those two approaches. I don't like having to click OK on a message box before I can fix the problem. So we're going to change the background color of the film name text box. So I'm going to say film name dot back color. And I'm going to make it equal to RGB pink, which was the same color I used in the previous video, just to keep things consistent. The really important thing that we're going to do is make sure that the rest of the procedure doesn't just continue. So currently all that would happen is the background colour of the film name text box goes pink and then everything else happens anyway. So we're going to add in a simple exit sub statement to make sure that the rest of this procedure does not continue. So just to give that one a quick test, let's head back into Excel. And if I show my form by clicking any of my three buttons and I try to click my add to list button without having entered a film name, the thing turns pink. There we go. Now there's a couple of things we could do here to improve on this system a little bit. So for instance, we could change the formatting properties of the corresponding label, as we did in the validation code in the previous video. Um, we could also, and this, this is one I quite like, is set the focus back to the text box that has a missing value. I don't know if you noticed when you click on the add to list button, that 
that sets the focus to that button, which means that if I want to add a value to the text box now, I have to manually click back in it. I know that doesn't sound like an awful lot of effort, but we can save time by for the user by automatically setting the focus back to that text box if they've missed it out. So I'm going to cancel uh, out of the form, just close it down, and then head back to the Visual Basic Editor, and we'll add a bit more code to the Add to List Buttons click event inside this if statement. Changing the four color of the film name label is nice and straightforward. We saw how to do that in the previous video, so we can say film name label dot four color. I'm going to make this equal to RGB red. Setting the focus of the film name text box is also pretty simple. There's a, there's a method called set focus. So we can say film name dot set focus, and that will automatically take the cursor and place it into that text box. So with those couple of very simple tweaks now, what we can do is head back into Excel and then try the same thing again. Um, I'm going to make sure that I've clicked into a different box this time. If I click my Add to List button, I'll see that the focus goes back to that text box. So without me clicking into it, um, the focus automatically goes back to it. And then, of course, the, uh, the font colour of the label turns red as well. Another nice touch would be to reset the formatting of the label and the text box to their original colours when the user does enter a film name. So if I entered a film name and tab away from the control, currently the colours don't change back. So we can use a similar technique to the one we used in the previous video, where we use the after update event of a text box to reset the colours of the text box and the, its corresponding label. So to do that, let's close down the form and head back to the Visual Basic Editor again. I want to get to the after update event of my te uh, film name text box, so we can double click the text box to generate its default event, which is the change event, it's not quite the one that I want. So I can use the drop down list at the top right hand corner and I can choose after update. I can then just delete the film name change event procedure, and then we can add a bit of code to change all the formatting back. The code to do this is pretty straightforward. To change the background colour of the film name text box, I can say film name dot back colour, and make that equal to RGB white. And then for the film name labels for colour, I want to change that so that it's equal to the for colour of the entire form. So film name, dot, film name label dot for colour equals me dot for colour. The thing is we only should, should do this if the value in the text box is not an empty string. So it might be that the user has decided to start typing in a film name and then backspaced or deleted it out and then tried to move away from the control. So that would remain with an empty string in the text box and that's no good. So we only want to change the back colour and the for colour back to their original states if film name dot value is not equal to an empty string. And don't forget the end if statement as well. OK, so that should all work. Let's have a look back in Excel to give it a quick test. If we show the form and then try to enter this without adding a film name, we can hit the Add to List button and we'll get our validation code triggering. If I start typing something in and then I decide to backspace it and then tap away from the control again, it doesn't change back. If I go back to the text box and type in a, a proper film name this time then click my Add to List button, everything does now work. So, there we go, perfect. Simple bit of validation for a single text box on the form. Now I'd just like to carry on and show you how this same approach would work for multiple text boxes on the same form. I'm going to have to make a slight change to the way my form works. Currently, because of the validation that's set on these individual text boxes, if I try to remove the default values that I've entered, I can't move away because they're checking for valid numbers and valid dates. So an empty string is not a valid number, so I can't carry on without adding a value there. Likewise for the dates, if I try to remove everything from the text box and move away, uh, an empty string is not a valid date either. So I'm going to change slightly the way the form works to remove the, uh, the default values from these text boxes, just to demonstrate the principle of, of testing multiple controls. So back to the VB editor, if I close the form down, the VB editor, I'm going to go to the initialize event of my form. So the initialize code is here, that's where I set the default values for the film gross and the film date um, text boxes. I'm just going to select those two controls, those two lines of text, and just comment them both out. What we can then do is head back up to the click event of the uh, the film, the add to list button, and add in a bit more validation code to check that the other text boxes have been filled in. Now the approach here isn't particularly sophisticated. It simply means repeating the same validation code we've added for the film name text box. In fact, the, the, the example is so similar that all I'm going to do is copy and paste the entire if block and paste it in immediately below. Then what I want to do here is I want to replace any reference to the film name text box and film name label to a film gross text box and a film gross label. So what I'm going to do is select all the text that I've just pasted, then I'm going to press Control h on the keyboard, which is the keyboard shortcut for find replace. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the word name and I'm going to replace that with the word gross. I want to do, make sure I do that only in the selected text. Be really wary about using this dialog box. Make sure it only has selected text so it won't replace everything in the entire um, project or module or procedure. So what I'm going to do then is click the replace all button and I get four replacements made. So you'll see that everything that was film name is now film gross. So I can take exactly the same approach then to the film date. I'm going to go back and I'm going to paste in the same if statements again and select all the text and press Control H. I'm going to find film name, sorry, name this time and I'm going to change that so it's date instead. So again, click replace all. I'll get four replacements made and that just saves manually typing in all those different values. Okay, so one more time, let's go back to Excel and I'm going to check by showing the form. I'm going to try to click on my add to list button. So I'll see my title text box gets um, turned pink. If I then go to the next control and try and add to list again, uh, the gross text box gets changed to pink. So I can't uh, enter the film without adding a gross. So let's add in some values there. Just, I think it's $731 million, I think, so far. And then if I, if I try to pass in again without adding a release date, again, that one will turn pink and force me to fill in a date there. So only when all of the individual values have been filled in can I now proceed with this, um, with this code. Now there are several things that aren't great about the way we've written this code, not least of which is the, the inefficiency of having to test each text box one by one. We're going to deal with that in a, slightly, in a different section of this same video. One other slightly irritating thing about the way this works is that each text box is, is checked one by one, so um, if I miss out all three text boxes it only indicates to me that there's one single problem with the form. It's not until I've filled that one in that the next one is then validated. It'd be nicer if I think, personally, if everything that was missing was highlighted in one go so you could see all the problems you've got to solve before clicking the Add to List button. So I'm going to close down the form and we're going to solve that problem by just slightly changing the way this system works. So back into the Visual Basic Editor and back to the click event of my Add to List button. We're going to modify the way these three if statements work so that each one doesn't exit the subroutine. The trick to making this work is using some kind of variable that can keep track of whether everything has been filled in or not. So we're going to use a boolean variable. I'm going to call mine um, everything filled in. And what we're going to assume to begin with um, at the start of the procedure is that everything has been filled in. So we're going to set everything filled in equals true. What we can then do subsequently is in each if statement, if we find that any of the values are, are missing, rather than exiting from the subroutine, all we're going to do instead is set the everything filled in variable equal to false. So we'll know that we definitely haven't filled in everything um, for that single specific text box. I'm going to copy and paste that line of code over every separate exit sub. So now currently what we've got is a situation where all the text boxes can be turned pink at the same time, but we don't um, exit from the subroutine at all at this stage, so all that would happen is the rest of the code for this procedure would then just continue. So right at the end of all of the if statements, we're going to have one single final check that's going to say, if not everything filled in, then exit sub. So that will only happen if any one or two or three of these if statements have changed the value of everything filled in. Um, just on, on Boolean um, logic, by the way, if you're testing Boolean values, this is kind of the preferred approach. Um, to test if it's false, you'd say if not everything filled in. To test if it's true, you just say if everything filled in. You can, if you prefer, and if it makes more sense to you, you can explicitly say if it is equal to true or if it is equal to false. Um, but preferably, you'd use the, uh, the other style. So I'm going to say if not everything filled in. OK, so let's give this one a quick test. If we go back into Excel, we should now be able to launch the form. And then as soon as we click the Add to List button, if I've missed out all three text boxes, all three of them get turned pink. It probably doesn't make sense anymore to set the focus to these individual text boxes either, because all, all that would happen is you'd set the focus to the last one. So I'm going to close down the form, just go back to the Visual Basic Editor, back to the click event of the button, and I'm just going to remove the lines which, ex uh, which set the focus to each control. I don't think there's much point in doing that anymore with the way this system works. 
OK, so we've got to the stage where everything works. The problem we've got here is just how much code we've had to write to make it work just for three text boxes. The approach we've taken is to test each text box individually. If we had another 10 text boxes, that means writing another 10 if statements, and that will get horribly tedious, Sp particularly because we're, we're testing the exact same test for every single text box and doing exactly the same actions for each one. So we're going to do a little bit of refactoring of this code to uh, to make this entire um, click event procedure a little bit more efficient. What I'm actually going to do is start by extracting the uh, the section that adds the details to the list into a separate subroutine altogether that we can then just call from this one. So it's going to shorten the click event procedure um, substantially. So what I'm going to do is declare another private sub in this uh, module. So I'm going to say private sub um, add data to list. And then all I'm going to do here is extract all the code that deals with that from my click event procedure. So that's everything from wsfilms.select down to displaying the message box. If I cut all of that out and then just paste it in the add data to list procedure. What I can then do is call that one from my main click event. So I can say call. Remember call is optional. You do not have to use the word call. And then look for my add data to list method. So that's um, that's done an awful lot to, uh, to tidy things up as already. We should do something similar then to the um, to the code that checks if everything's been filled in. The problem we've got with this one though is that we need to be able to determine or at least return to the main procedure whether everything has been filled in or not. So we can't just use a simple subroutine to make this work. We're going to have to declare a function that can return a boolean value that refers to whether everything has been filled in or not. Now declaring a function isn't too much different to declaring a subroutine, it's just that instead of starting with the word sub, you start with the word function instead. So again, it doesn't really matter where in the module you do this, I'm going to declare a private function, and I'm going to call this one everything filled in. I'm deliberately using the same name that I've already used for the variable in the previous subroutine. Um, now the important thing about functions is you, that you return some kind of value from the function and it's important to state what type of data that will be so everything filled in as boolean. What I'm then going to do is cut a whole bunch of code out of the um, the original subroutine. Um, I don't need this variable declaration anymore I'm going to delete that one entirely I'm replacing the variable now with a, with my function. Then I'm going to copy everything from everything filled in equals true down to the end of the if statement for the film date text box. So I'm going to cut all of that out and then paste all that into the function. A um, quick little bit of tidying up here. So the idea is um, when this line of code runs in the main click event, this is going to call my function everything filled in. And the first thing that happens in that function is it says everything filled in equals true. So that assumes that everything has been filled in. Then it just runs through the same if statements that we've previously used. And if any of those are empty, it says everything filled in equals false. At the end of the function, this is going to return a value to the line which called it. So everything filled in will be either true or false. And it will only be true if all the text boxes have been filled in. It will be false if any single one of them is empty. So the end result to the end user is exactly the same as we had it earlier on. If I go back to Excel and give this one a quick test, if I miss everything out, everything's pink. If I type in a number for one of the boxes and click add to list, it will highlight only the things that are still missing. If I enter a valid date, um, then this will work. And then finally, if I fill in a, a, a fill name, this will also now work. So the whole thing just works beautifully and intuitively for the end user. The advantage we've got here is that we've made a, a massive improvement to the way the code is organized. So our add, add to list click event now is just four lines of code rather than the huge number it was previously. And we've encapsulated all of the logic of whether everything's filled in in this nice, simple, straightforward function. One other major improvement we're going to make to the way this function works is to avoid having to test each individual text box one by one. We're going to replace all of these if statements with a loop which processes all of the controls on the form in one go. So this will have a couple of advantages. First of all, it will shorten this function as it stands, so make it much less code. Um, and we're also going to make sure that we don't have to edit this later on should we decide to add more text boxes to the form. So let's start by getting rid of all of these individual if statements. We don't need any of those anymore. So select those and delete or backspace them. Bye bye hard work. And what we're going to do is replace that with a loop which loops over all of the controls on the form. 
Now, if you've watched the previous Excel VBA tutorial series, you should be fairly familiar with a for each loop and the things involved. But if not, we'll give you a quick overview of what we need to do to write a for each loop. So to start with, we need to declare a variable which can hold a reference to the type of object that I'm trying to investigate. So I'm going to say dim ctl as msforms.control. So that represents a single individual control object on the form. It could be anything. It could be a text box, a label, a button, a frame, anything. Um, just a quick note, I've referenced the MS Forms library here. Technically, I don't need to do that. I could just say dimctl as control. The reason I've referred to MS Forms is this is the name of the library which contains the definition of a control object. Just to give you a quick overview of what that means, in the Tools menu, I choose References. This shows me a list of all the object libraries that my VBA project currently has loaded. You see one here is called Microsoft Forms 2.0 Object Library. So this library contains definitions for all of the objects to do with Microsoft Forms. If you want to see what those objects are, you can head to the View menu at the top of the screen and choose Object Browser. And depending on what libraries you've got loaded, um, you can choose to show either all libraries from the drop-down list at the top. That shows you all the objects that are currently defined. You can also limit this list to show objects only contained in a single library. So if I choose MS Forms from the list, that shows me that I've got control and controls listed here. So control is a single object, controls is a collection of all of them. Um, now the reason I'm, I'm referencing my MS Forms library in my code is to avoid any ambiguity in case I have another object library loaded, which also has a definition for a control object. Um, as it turns out, I don't have any libraries loaded that have a, a multiple definitions of, of control objects. But just for future proofing this, if I do re uh, reference more libraries, this makes sure that I'm definitely referring to the Microsoft Forms control rather than any other type of control. OK, so now that we've got that done, we can write the loop that will process each individual control in the collection of all the controls on the form. So I'm going to begin my for each loop just below the line which says everything built in equals true. I'm going to say for each CTL in. And then I have to reference the collection to which a control belongs. Now the simple default way to do that is just to say controls. Controls implicitly refers to the collection of all of the controls on the form. Um, you can qualify that if you like with a reference to the form itself. So I could say film details dot controls. Um, film details is the, the object name of the form that we created in the first video of the series. We saw earlier on in the series as well that you can replace a reference to the form's full name with a quick shortcut, me. So me.controls refers to all of the controls on the entire form. Just to demonstrate what this will do, we're not going to actually validate the controls just yet. All we're going to do here is just list out the names of all the controls. So I'm going to use the debug.print statement to say ctl.name. That will be printed out into the immediate window when this code runs. All we have to do then is make sure that we move on to the next control. So we can do that just by saying next. Um, I prefer to qualify that again by saying which next control variable I'm moving on to, so next CTL. I just want to demonstrate what this will do um, uh, in terms of printing out the names of all the controls. So I'm going to make sure that we can see the immediate window by hitting the view menu and choosing immediate window or pressing control G on the keyboard. And then we're going to go back into Excel and all we have to do to trigger this code is to show the form and click the add to list button. So um, it's adding a completely blank row, that's absolutely fine, don't worry too much about that. What we should find then is that we go back to the VB editor and we look into the immediate window, it's listed out every single control on the entire form. So I've got my three labels, my three text boxes, my add to list button, the cancel button and the film details frame. Now the reason I'm mentioning this is because as well as the form having a controls collection, each frame in the form also has its own separate sub-collection of controls. So rather than looping over all of the controls on the entire form, we could choose to loop over the controls just within this frame. In order to make that work, you need to know what that frame was called. So if I just select the frame, I'll say its name was Film Details Frame. That's the name that I gave it when we designed the form in the first place. So back, going back to the code behind um, behind the form, if I were to find this um, this loop that we were just looping through here, rather than saying me dot controls, we could say Film Details Frame dot controls. So um, that will limit the list of controls that we loop over. And just to demonstrate that, I'm going to clear out the contents of the immediate window so I can click into it, press Control A, and then hit the Delete key on the keyboard. Then go back into Excel and then show my form on screen and click my Add to List button, making it add another blank row. If I click OK then and go back to the Visual Basic Editor, I'll see this time the immediate window only lists out the controls that are part of the frame, so the three labels and the three text boxes. So it makes the loop ever so slightly more efficient. Um, it means we don't have to loop over the entire collection of all the controls. We can limit it to just the items inside the frame. 
The next thing that we need to add to the loop is a test to make sure that we're only looking at the text boxes within the controls collection. It'd be great if we could actually just loop over the text boxes separately, but sadly there is no text boxes collection, so we have to loop over the controls collection. It'd be nice if we could maybe change the uh, the variables that we were referring to just a text box. So we could declare a text box variable in txt as msforms.textbox, but I couldn't then subsequently use that variable to process the controls collection because not every control is a text box. So this is what we're forced into doing. We, we can't just say um, um, loop over just the text boxes. We have to loop over all of the controls and then test the type of each one. So one way to achieve that is to say if type of ctl is and then I need to refer to the msforms text box class. So I can say msforms dot text box and if that's true then I want to print out the name of the control. So I'm just going to just uh, tap that in and make sure I've added an end if statement. There we go and then one more time I'm going to display the immediate window and then clear its contents and just test this one more time by going back into Excel and showing the formal screen and clicking the Add to List button. Click OK, back to the VB Editor, and I can see now that I've just limited my list now to, to identifying just the text boxes. But the great thing about this is that it will work regardless of how many text boxes were inside this frame. If I added another 20, I'd see the names of every single text box inside the immediate window. So the last step of this is to check that the text boxes values are empty and if they are do something in terms of indicating to the user that there's a problem. So let's start by removing the debug.print statement. We don't need that anymore, that was just for testing purposes. And we'll replace that with another if statement that checks if the controls value is an empty string. So we'll say if ctl.value. Slightly confusingly, the value property doesn't appear in the IntelliSense list. I'm going to explain why that's the case in just a moment. Just go with it for now. This will actually work. So if ctl.value is equal to an empty string, then I'm going to leave myself a blank line or two and type in end if, just so I don't forget. And if that's the case, what we're going to do is change the back color of the control. So I'll say ctl.back color. And again, back color won't appear in the IntelliSense list. Just go with it. You can type in back color. If you're in the UK, make sure you spell that in the American way, so no U in the word colour there. And make that equal to RGB pink, just as we did earlier on. And then last thing to do, and, and the important thing to do, is make sure that we set the everything filled in value to be equal to false. So everything filled in equals false. Okay, so there we go. There's the, um, the, the basic loop written and working. If we can just test this out in Excel, we can then uh, show our form on screen, click Add to List, and the basic technique works. We've got the, the, the background colors of the text boxes turning pink. If I fill in a value and then click onto the next control, it goes white. If I um, hit Add to List again, it still won't work. It's having numbers and so on and so on. So it works to the same extent as it worked earlier on. We haven't got the labels changing color. We'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Um, but the really important thing that we've got here is a much shorter, more efficient set of code that checks if all of the text boxes have been filled in. And should we add in any number of other text boxes into this frame, then this code doesn't need to be changed at all. It will happily handle any number of text boxes um, that you can add. Okay, so I just wanted to explain why our CTL variable didn't display the full IntelliSense list um, as we'd expect. We didn't see the value property or the back color property appear, even though those technically now work. The reason is all to do with what type of class we've defined the CTL variable as. We've called it an msforms.control. Now, if I go back to the object browser, as we briefly saw earlier on, view object browser or just press F2 on the keyboard, we'll see that in the msforms object library, the control class has a very limited set of properties. So there is no value property listed here and there's no back color property listed. A control is the most generic type of object you can add onto a form. So all controls, all text boxes, combo boxes, check boxes, etc. They all inherit their, their basic properties from the control class. The text box class, if I scroll down, there's a separate text box class. Um, if I select that, it's got its own distinct list of properties. There's a specific back color property listed there and a specific value property listed down here. So um, what we can do to solve this problem, if it really annoys you, I mean, obviously we don't need to do this next step because the code works anyway. But if you should want to make your code a little bit more robust or at least more, more correct technically, then what we can do here is declare another variable that can hold a reference to a text box object. So I'm going to say this in txt as msforms.textbox. What we can then do 
inside this first if statement that checks if the type of control is an MS Forms text box. What I would like to do is set txt to be equal to ctl. So essentially transfer a copy of what's in the control variable into the txt variable. What I can then do instead of using the control variable to refer to the value property in the back color property, I can replace that section by saying txt value. So now because txt is a reference to a text box object, I see the full list of properties that every text box has. So I've got value listed there, and I will also have back color listed. So txt dot back color. One thing we have lost by switching to this loop style of validation rather than testing each text box individually is the ability to easily change the label for colors. When we're looping over the controls, we have no idea what the corresponding label should be. So we've got one way we can uh, we can we can do this. I'm going to show you now um, using a different type of way to, to reference controls on a form. So previously, what we've done so far is reference controls by their code name. Another way to reference controls on a form, we mentioned this briefly in one of the earlier videos, is you can reference a control um, by its name in the controls collection. So rather than referring to a text box with its full complete name, like, like down here, like fill name, I could have also referred to this text box as controls fill name dot value. This would do exactly the same job. Um, so the idea behind this is you're passing in a string of text which represents the text box. Um, so I'm just going to change that back to the way it was before. We can rely on this technique, providing we have a fairly sensible naming convention for the controls in our form, we can use this technique to refer to the corresponding label to any text box. So the way I've referred to my labels and text box combinations, I call the text box fill name and the label fill name label, text box film gross, label film gross label, and so on and so on and so on, film date, film date label. So now that I've made that consistent link between the label and the text box, I can rely on this to change the labels for color. So we can add this line of code in just after we've changed the text box's back color. We can refer to the controls collection, and then the first part of the name of any label is the same as the name of the text box control. So I can say ctl.name, or txt.name if I prefer, and then concatenate to the end of that the word label. So that will construct the name of the, uh, the object. What I can then do is refer to the four color property, no IntelliSense at all when you reference a control using the controls collection like so, but make that equal to RGB red. So it's a relatively simple technique. We're just constructing the name of the control that we want to change based on the name of the text box or the control that we're currently looking at. So if that's been done, what we can then do is go back into Excel and once again, give it a quick test. So show the form on screen, click the Add to List button, and we get the labels turning red now as well. Um, do I just close that one down and then just show the form again just to prove that it will work for uh, for individual controls so it doesn't change the text, the, the four color of, of any label, just the ones that match the missing text boxes. So there we go, back to pretty much, for the end user at least, the same end experience. The last thing that was missing from this style of validation was the ability to set the focus back to a text box that has a missing value. If I click the Add to List button, it steals the focus and then I have to manually click into a text box before I can start typing. Now, we could set the focus to each individual text box that's missing, so we could easily go and add that line of code. If I close down the form and go back to the Visual Basic Editor and then go to the Click Event of the button and get back to my Everything Filled In function, we could easily add in a line of code that says ctl.setFocus. So there we go. All that would happen though in that case, if I go back to Excel, is that it would be the last text box that was missing that would have the focus set to it. So each of these text boxes has had the focus set, it's just that the last one that was missing was a release set, so that's where we end up. It'd be nicer, I think, and it'd make more sense from an end user perspective to set the focus to the first control that had a missing value. That requires a little bit more work, but it's certainly not impossible. So let's go back to the Visual Basic Editor and the same uh, function, and we'll add a bit of code that will make this part work. One simple approach to making this work would be to use another boolean variable to check whether anything is missing yet. So the way this would work, we'd declare another variable at the top of the function. So we say dim anything missing as boolean, and we'd set that to be false to begin with. That's actually the default value for a boolean variable anyway, but just to be explicit about that, we're going to say anything missing equals false. So what we could do then is, in the line that says ctl.setFocus, we'd only want to do that if there was nothing missing yet. So we're going to say, if not anything missing, then 
set the focus to that control. So that would mean that the very first control that we encounter that's, that's missing would have its focus set. We then want to make sure that we change anything missing to be equal to true. So we've established that we have found at least one missing value. So we say anything missing equals true. So that would mean that the next time through the loop, um, this line won't set the focus to a control because we have discovered that there is something missing. So at that point, all we're going to do is head back to Excel, give this one a test by showing the form on screen, and we'll see if I hit my edge list button, my focus gets set to the title text box. If I show it again and I've typed in, let's say I've typed in a title this time, and I hit add to list, it'll set the focus to the, the gross text box. So, a uh, fairly quick and simple and easy approach. Um, not necessarily the most efficient way to do it, but it works and it ends up with a nicer end user experience as well. So I think that pretty much wraps up all the things we're going to do in terms of validating forms. We've seen how to uh, validate controls individually for specific rules, and we've also seen how to test controls over the entire form as sort of an overview level to check that everything's been filled in. So we've got some pretty robust validation code running there. So the next few parts of this series are going to focus on different types of controls. So some of the more advanced controls like drop down lists and list boxes and so on and so on. So hope you'll join us for that one. Um, see you next time. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching. See you next time.